Dear Mr. Valentine, As per your request, I've collected reliable morsels of information from the many and often incoherent accounts that details the events which transpired in Merton on September 2nd, 1996. It is only with great reluctance that I reveal this information to you, for I fear for my life that I am pursued with the intent of execution. Yet, I am a professional, and as such, I will hold up my end of this terrible bargain. But I warn you that you may be better off unaware of the events which transpired in Merton on September 2nd, 1996. August 31st, 1996. According to the more reliable sources, even with which corroboration was a cruel goal, the event began on August 31st, when the librarian, Miss Lori Lassell, came across the leather-bound book called Apocryphex, which she believed to be worth quite a great deal of money, for its binding and contents suggested great age. The book, though I now dread to speak of it, was written in a language that Mrs. Lassell could neither understand nor distinguish. Determined to discover its value, she brought it to the nearest university, LSU, at Shreveport, where she presented it to some of the faculty for appraisal. Among them, the varying sources cannot seem to agree between the presence of three faculty or four, was Dr. Vance Ridley, who told me in my interview with him in 2004, I felt a deep uneasiness about Apocryphex, and could tell Dr. Smith that is an alias, by the way, felt the same way. I'm not a religious man, but the closest I've come to believe in the spiritual was when I beheld that ancient book, and now I'm glad to believe not, though Dr. Smith believes I do so foolishly. According to Dr. Ridley, an authority in the cryptanalysis and linguists, the book was written in some perversion of Latin or Occitan. The bastard language was very pleasant to hear, nearly musical. Though Dr. Ridley assured me that the translation, though he could only produce a rough one, was not so easy on the ears. The document which contained the translation has since been lost before it could be shipped to me, though Dr. Ridley has told me that the tome was a collection of old alchemical recipes, perhaps written by an antiquian monk in the ninth century, though its condition would seem to place it in a much more recent date. He assured me that the translation bordered on nonsense, though from our conversations, Mr. Valentine, I am led to believe that you would disagree. I'm still searching for the translation. September 1st, 1996. On September 1st, early in the morning, Mrs. Lasso retrieved Apocryphex from the university who warned her to take caution with the book, for it was a priceless artifact, considering its bizarre contents and pristine condition. This information was relayed to many friends of Miss Lassell on their September 1st book club meeting. I've spoken with many of those women, and it is from them that I've gathered much of this information regarding the Apocryphex, though the current location of the original copy eludes us all. After her book club, which ended around noon, Miss Lassell went home and showed the book to her boyfriend, Mr. Gary Rogers, who owns that quaint diner on the bluff near Cato Lake. Mr. Rogers, excited by the nature of Miss Lassell's find, urged her to bring Apocryphex to the citywide picnic to be held near the lake. She agreed to do so. This information regarding Apocryphex cannot be tied directly to the event which would transpire the next day, though the arrival of the old book, only two days before the event, seemed too ominous to ignore, and with this suspicion I present this report. Miss Lassell died on September 2nd, 1996, and so I could not question her. Mr. Rogers spoke with me briefly before suggesting I leave the town, which name has since been changed as you know, and which I'm obligated not to report here. September 2nd, 1996 At 9 a.m., then-Mayor Frederick Murphy went out to the site of the picnic near Cato Lake with two wildlife experts and four members of the city council, one of whom still serves to this day. It was a clear day. The lake was calm. 
the wildlife experts confirmed that there were no alligators in the area and set up a monitoring station in the thicket of some nearby trees to watch for any unwanted wildlife that may intrude about the picnic. The city councilman, whom I would reach for questioning, reported nothing unusual during this precaution. Around 10 a.m., volunteers began setting up tents, tables, and chairs. A local extermination company was hired by the city to treat the area for mosquitoes and did so. Some of the volunteers think that the chemical used to repel and kill the mosquitoes may have somehow been connected with the event. Scattered reports claim there was an altercation between one of the exterminators and volunteers, both of whom were in the process of divorce. None of the exterminators who were present that day still worked there when I reached them for questioning, but the manager, who was only present for the threatening and not for the picnic itself, suggested that the volunteers had set up the grill too close to the water's edge. Comments from the former mayor suggest that neither of these reports are reliable, since he recalls a distinct division between the exterminators and volunteers regarding the nature of the divorce. At 10.30 a.m., Burton police arrived and began setting up cones. Most of the police officers who were present are now deceased, but one survivor, Officer Daniel Patton, says that nothing seemed out of the ordinary, besides having to escort a hysterical woman off the lot. At 11 a.m., residents of Merton, who were taking place in the annual chili competition, were allowed to set up their tents. According to Mr. Rogers and a few volunteers, Miss Lasso was quite a contender for this event and showed up early to set up her station. Officer Patton reports that there still seemed to be nothing of note occurring at this point. According to Mr. Rogers, she had bought Apocryphex with her. At some point between 11 and noon, the wildlife experts had to chase away an alligator who had come too close to the lot. According to the wildlife experts, it was rare for alligators to travel so far away from the deeper channels of Cato Lake, though it certainly wasn't unheard of. Otherwise, they reported nothing of note. At noon, the picnic was officially open to the public. Before one, a good portion of the residents population of Merton was 426 as of 1990, had arrived and began setting up their areas. Many witnesses report a general uneasiness, though this is likely only a sentiment believed to be felt in hindsight. Officer Patton recalls seeing Apocryphex when sampling Miss Lazel and Mr. Rogers' chili, but didn't think much of it. This is the last reported sighting of the book before the incident though Mr. Roger insists that Miss Lasso had shown the book to several people who had stopped by for chili. When pressed for names of people who may have remembered having contact with the book, he can only provide names of individuals who have since passed away. This is where reports begin to vary. According to the wildlife experts, there were two alligators swimming quite a distance from the shore who were being closely monitored, According to Officer Patton, reports to the police ranging from one to seven alligators required for most of the Metro police force to be stationed at the shore to watch for alligators. Most of the residents I interviewed were unaware of the alligators or stated that there were none at all. At 1 p.m. on September 2nd, 1996, disaster struck in Merton, Louisiana. What happened exactly is nearly impossible to say, but I have tried with the utmost meticulousness to string together what seemed to have been an incoherent and unrelated reports for the sake of clarity, though I believe this to be a laughably hopeless pursuit. Most witnesses recall the picnic being interrupted by what sounded like a largely, nearly muted horn above the clouds. This phenomenon has been reported all over the world at various times, and has even been documented on video if you're interested in researching it further. These sounds, according to witnesses, were comparable to two enormous pieces of machinery grinding together. Next, a few reports claimed that a swift wave swept over the lake, but the wildlife experts watching the lake disagree that this ever happened. The horn sounds ended abruptly, and many witnesses recall, often with a shiver or a reflective sigh, the brief and stunned silence that fell over them. And then, the 
waterfront erupted in noise. The police officers began firing into the water, panicked. Officer Patton claims that one of the officers screamed and began firing into the water, leading to a sort of hysteria amongst them. Once the firing began, he quickly left his post to make sure the residents didn't get hurt in the panic. Most witnesses attempted to flee once the gunfire began, but some faced the water to determine what the threat was. Scattered reports say that an alligator emerged from the water to grab one of the officers. Whatever the case, it was only moments after the firing began that an impossibly large wave burst from Cato and swept the officers into the lake. The water rose so rapidly that it flooded around half the picnic site and swept many residents, including Miss Lassell, off their feet. Many were dragged into the lake where the wave receded. Witnesses report that dozens rushed in to try and help those being washed toward the water when a second impossibly large and rapidly forming wave crashed over the picnic, this time covering a wider area. One witness who was swept into the water recalled with bitter tears screaming as those trying to swim back to the shore were dragged under the surface of the lake by powerful jaws. In the horror of the frenzy, many witnesses, guided by Officer Patton, fled to the parking lot. Officer Patton returned to the scene to find a horrific mass of writhing bodies, hoping against hope itself to reach dry land. The water was red from blood and Swimming calmly between the wildly thrashing figures were the scaly spines of reptilian predators. A third, though some insist there was a fourth, wave crashed over the scene and dragged many more of the citizens and officers into the depths of the lake where massive jaws were bursting forth from beneath the water and crushing flesh and bone before dragging the helpless victims below the surface. Finally... Six survivors clambered to the shore where they were treated by Officer Patton and a medical team who had now arrived. Witnesses report that, after the survivors had escaped, there was an eerie silence which seemed to last for several minutes. Though the water was dark red from the blood of the slain, no bodies or even articles of clothing were ever recovered from the lake. The incident was so crushing that most of the witnesses left Merton, which would later be renamed. Of the six survivors, one joined a cult and one died of cancer two years later. The event was never published in any paper, and those who died in the incident were said to have died of natural causes. You and I both know, of course, how detestably unnatural this entire ordeal was. Perhaps the most disturbing detail of all came from the wildlife experts who were safe in their perch. Across the lake in a mass of swampy foliage, alligators were watching the carnage intently, though the experts claimed that no alligators ever neared the shore. Worst of all, the experts tell me, is that no alligators were present during the attacks at all. Mr. Valentine, I beseech you to not look any further into the matter. One of the eyewitnesses I interviewed has since sent me several death threats and has made claims so wild that I dare not publish them in this report. Please, sir. If you value your life and your sanity, be satisfied with the account I have provided you. And above all, please do not seek after Apocryphex. I'm a professional, and as such, I've fulfilled my contract with you. I will not further investigate the events which transpired in Merton on September 2nd, 1996, lest I suffer a fate worse than the now constant terror that grips me even as I write this letter. God bless you, sir. And God help us all. Mr. L. Before we get into the last story for tonight, I have a quick question I wanted to ask. It does relate to the second story, so don't worry. Have you ever felt strange or uneasy or just felt like something was off about mirrors in general. 
I know people say that they can be used as a gateway to the afterlife. Some people believe that you're not looking at your reflection, but rather something like another version of you almost like a different dimension do you believe in that do you believe that mirrors are a gateway do you believe there's something malicious about them paranormal even let me know in the comment section below think about it while you're listening and let me know in the comment section below You know that old horror movie trope about mirrors? The one where the protagonist is near a mirror and they look or shift away from the mirror just for a moment. And when they look back, a ghost, killer, some other entity appears and then usually rapidly disappears when they turn around. I've always disliked looking into mirrors. And for a while, I convinced myself that it was caused by an overactive imagination combined with seeing this situation one too many times in a movie. But as I've gotten older, I've come to realize that it's much more than that. I don't dislike looking into mirrors. I'm afraid of it. Something has always just felt off about it. I recognize the image of my reflection as me, but it has never felt familiar. I brought it up to a friend once, and she goggled at me for a moment and then laughed, though I could hear a tinge of fear behind it. <laughs> what do you mean you don't recognize your reflection? How is that even possible? It's the same reflection you've been staring at your whole life. And she was right, of course. But that was part of the problem. My reflection has never felt normal to me. Not in the way that it should. Not in the way that it does to other people. I've observed the reflections of friends and family members, and when they're standing near mirrors, it doesn't feel the same. It feels connected to them, a simple mirror image. Even when their eyes meet mine in the mirror, I don't feel the oppressive feeling of other that I get when I meet my own eyes at my reflection. With no explanation that seemed to fit my experiences, I chalked it up to just being a weird quirk and decided to just get on with my life. When I moved into my first apartment by myself, I removed all the mirrors, except for the one that I keep in my guest room. It stayed covered with a sheet, unless I absolutely needed to use it. You'd be surprised how well you can get by without mirrors when you've been doing it your whole life. I even got pretty good at applying makeup without seeing what I was doing. Every once in a while. I'd catch my reflection in a mirror in a public bathroom, or if I looked wrong into my rearview mirror, and it would set my heart racing. I always felt menaced when it happened, and it would take me a few moments to calm down again. But all in all, I was doing fairly well with my mirror avoidance strategy. However, all that changed one day at work. I work in the Artifact Restoration Department in my city's History Museum. It's typically fascinating, delicate, and detailed work, and I love it. I mostly work with pottery, or statues, and carvings, but I always knew that one day, someone would bring me an antique mirror to restore, and I'd have no choice but to do it. I'd been at the museum for five years, and it still hadn't happened. I'd almost convinced myself that I was in the clear. But alas, that was not the case. It was late on a Friday when it was first brought to me. The museum director had it wheeled in under a sheet, but I immediately knew what it was. I could tell from the dread that practically exploded inside me. He beamed at me as he whipped the sheet off. Isn't it magnificent? He crowed. Early 1700s. French. He smiled at me, waiting for my exclamations over its beauty, I'm sure. My breath felt like it was caught in my throat. I stared down at my reflection for the first time in what had been years. It looked back at me, also with a petrified expression, but it felt different. 
Like my reflection's face was an act. A mimicking of my face, not an exact copy. I stood transfixed for a minute, trapped under my own gaze. Suddenly, the director stepped into my line of view, blocking the mirror from my sight. Well, what do you think? Gorgeous, isn't it? Doesn't look like it needs too much work. A little spit and shine, maybe. He said with a grin, winking at me. Yeah, gorgeous, I mumbled. He must have noticed how white I had gone, because he recovered the mirror and put his hand on my shoulder. I don't stress about it. I know you'll do a great job. And don't worry about starting today. You can get cracking on it on Monday. The daddy turned and left the room, leaving me alone with the mirror. Put my head in my hands and rubbed my temples with my thumbs. Okay. You can do this. You have the whole weekend to prepare. I looked up at the clock. 5.15. I grabbed my things and head for the door. I'll deal with the mirror on Monday. I'd almost made it all the way out of the building when I realized I left my keys on my work table. Shit, I moaned. But there was nothing to be done for it. I needed the keys to lock up the building. Before I opened the door back to my workspace, I took a deep breath. It's just a st- stupid mirror. I said to myself. I stepped into the room. Everything looked normal. I stepped quickly past the mirror to my desk. And I bent down to open the drawer where I kept my keys. And when I turned around, the sheets that had been covering the mirror moments before was in a pile on the floor in front of it. My knees went weak and I had to grab onto my desk to keep them from buckling. It just fell. That's all. I whispered out loud. When I walked by it quickly, it made a breeze and knocked it off. I felt deep down that that was not what had happened at all, but saying it out loud gave me enough courage to approach the mirror to replace the sheet. Once I was in front of it, I knelt down to grab the sheet, never once taking my eyes off my reflection. As I straightened back up, I turned to face the mirror head on. With one hand, I reached out and lightly pressed my fingertips against my reflections. My fingers stopped at the cold, hard glass. It was cold enough that the warmth from my fingers fogged up a little area around each tip. My reflection had the tiniest of smiles playing around her lips. I didn't feel myself smiling, but it was such a small one, perhaps I didn't notice myself doing it. I rearranged my face into grotesque poses just to make sure my reflection did it too. She did, but it brought me little comfort. I took a step forward until my face was practically touching the mirror. I could see every pore, every freckle. It looked familiar, but it felt alien. I breathed onto it, fogging the surface in front of my face. I slowly traced a heart into the fog. Saw my reflection do the same, but then I noticed something odd. I couldn't see the heart I drew in the reflection. My heart began to thump wildly in my chest. I hastily used my sleeve to wipe away the remnants of my breath. The fog in the reflection, however, remained. I sucked in a sharp breath of air and took a staggering step back. I pressed my palms into my eyelids until I saw stars. I slowly counted to ten and opened my eyes. All I could see was my reflection staring worriedly back at me. She looked pale, faint, exactly how I felt. But it still didn't look or feel quite right. I threw the sheet back over the mirror and ran out of the building. By the time I arrived home, I'd calmed down significantly, enough that I was suddenly able to remember that I had a date that night. I groaned out loud. I didn't really want to go, but I actually did like this guy. We'd already been on a few dates and had hit it off well, so I pulled myself together as best I could. 
By the time Nick arrived to pick me up, I'd shaken off the vestiges of my earlier terror. While at dinner, he asked me how my day had been. I hesitated, not wanting to tell him about what had happened or about my irrational and odd reactions to mirrors, but... But I suddenly realized I had a desperate desire to tell someone about what had happened, even if it made me sound crazy. I relayed the story to him, never once looking into his eyes. I didn't want to see what I knew would be reflected there. Fear. Anxiety. Disgust. But when I finished and did look up, he was simply studying me. After a moment, he reached out and took my hand. You know what I read once? He asked. I shook my head silently. It was one of those micro-blog social media sites. It said, what if the only reason we can't walk through mirrors is because our reflection blocks us? What if they know that the other side is horrifying and painful and they're just trying to keep us from crossing over? He shrugged. Just a weird thing I read. But it sounds like yours isn't trying to protect you, it's trying to get out of there. He said with a laugh. Wouldn't that be something? That would explain why you feel like you do. I sat in stunned silence. My throat was dry as the desert. I had to forcefully swallow several times before I could speak again. Yeah, that, uh, that would be something. My mind was racing with what he'd said as we left the restaurant. His little theory perfectly described how I felt, but I didn't know what to do with that information. It was nonsense, after all. I wanted to only go home at that point, but Nick grabbed my hand. I actually have something in mind for us to do tonight, but it's a surprise. I sighed internally, but smiled at him. Sure, lead the way. We got a cab and got out in front of what looked like an old abandoned warehouse. I might have thought that's what it was, too, if it wasn't for the line of people out the door. What's this? I asked. It's an adventure space, he said with a huge smile. Kind of like a playhouse for grown-ups. I've seen it advertised all over the place. There's supposed to be things to explore and climb on, stuff like that. I couldn't help but smile at his infectious excitement. Okay, let's check it out, I said with a giggle. The first few rooms were indeed a lot of climbing and twisting and bending and crawling. We kept losing each other and then finding each other by the sound of our laughter. I was surprised how much fun I was having. He grabbed my hand as we moved toward the last room. I think you'll like this one the best, he said, pulling me forward. I was about to ask why, but the word died on my lips as we walked through the doorway. It was a room full of mirrors. A much larger and more terrifying version of a fun house made for children. He shoved me further into the room so that the door behind us slammed shut. To help you get over your fear, he said with another shove. Never before had I felt the level of fear that rose in my chest than at that moment. It was all-consuming. It wiped nearly every other thought from my mind. I was facing down hundreds of my own reflection, and they looked horrifying. I turned to Nick to beg him to help me out of here, but he disappeared. Nick? I croaked, my voice cracking with terror. Nick! I screamed. I heard him laughing as he shouted, This way! I stumbled forward, hands outstretched, unable to tell which way was correct. Tears began pouring out of my eyes as I struggled to breathe under the weight of my panic. Every direction looked like it was a reflection of myself, each one looking more ominous than the last. I turned a corner and saw hundreds of reflections at the back of my head all lined up in a row. I was paralyzed with fear. 
closed my eyes, took a few shuddering deep breaths. Nick! I called out again. This time I got no answer. I knew to get out I was going to have to open my eyes. There was no way I was making it out of there blind. I opened my eyes and was greeted with the same sight I'd seen when I closed them. I exhaled loudly. A tiny wave of relief hit me. I heard a noise to my right and turned my head that way. Nick? I asked again. When I looked forward again, all of my reflections were facing away from me. All except for the one in front. She was facing me with a horrible grin plastered onto her face. She beckoned for me as if in a trance I could only shake my head. When I didn't move forward, her grin turned into a snarl and she began slamming her fist against the glass. I let out a blood-curdling scream as I saw my vision go spotty. I stepped back in such a panic that I smashed into the mirror behind me and felt a sharp pain in the back of my head as a shower of glass rained down around me. I'm certain I passed out for a moment, both from pain and fear. When I came to, I could feel something warm and sticky dripping down my back. I reached up, my hand, and it came away bloody. Fuck, I moaned. I could faintly hear Nick yelling for me. I dragged myself up into a sitting position, wincing as my hands and legs got further cut up from the glass. Across the room, I could see Nick and hundreds of Nick's reflections kneeling down in front of me. I closed and rubbed my eyes, shaking my head in the process. How could Nick be with my reflection when he wasn't there with me? I must have hit my head harder than I thought. I could hear him talking, but it sounded muted and far away. I heard the word help, but not much more. He stood up and sprinted for the door. I couldn't tell if he was coming back or not, and as it seemed like I could get up and walk, I decided to try. I was still anxious to get out of this hall of horrors. I finally made it to the exit door. It had become extremely foggy and unreasonably cold while we were inside. The air had a terrible metallic tang to it that filled my nose and mouth. I shivered in the wind that whipped brutally around me. I glanced around as I realized I didn't see anyone else nearby. No people, no cars, nothing. Grimacing, I whipped out my phone to call for an ambulance myself, but the battery was dead. Come on, I yelled in frustration. I slowly started hobbling toward the road. I figured I could at least catch a cab, but there was no one on the road either. I began to cry again. What a nightmare this night had turned out to be. I staggered home, alone and freezing. When I got back inside, I plugged my phone in. I needed to let someone know that I was hurt and where I ended up. When the phone powered on, a barrage of texts came in, mostly from Nick. But they were all jumbled up. A random mix of letters, numbers, and symbols. I couldn't make heads or tails of any of it. I tried to send a text back, but it refused to send. I couldn't even get a signal to make a call. Panic, bitter, like bile, threatened to rise up again, but I fought it off. I could deal with the shoddy cell service later. For now, I needed to take care of myself. Once I started to clean myself up, I quickly realized that most of my cuts were shallow or superficial. I was able to get the glass out and get everything cleaned up on my own. Well, every piece except for one. I could feel one near the top of my head that I just couldn't get a good grip on. I closed my eyes and let out a deep breath. I was going to need to use the mirror. I hobbled into the guest room and slowly pulled away the sheet. Before, 
There had been nothing more frightening than seeing my reflection in the mirror. But that night, I realized there was one thing more terrifying than seeing my reflection in the mirror. Not seeing it at all. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed tonight's stories. I did. I enjoyed them quite a bit, actually. I think the second one was my favorite out of the two, but they were both really, really good. Um, think about that question that I asked about the mirrors. Do you feel any certain type of way about them? Have you ever felt unnerved by them? I definitely have. I'm of the belief that maybe they are some type of portal. Maybe not necessarily, but maybe they hold some type of power in that regard. That's why you will never see me attempting anything like Bloody Mary or even Candyman or fucking Beetlejuice for that matter. I will not be doing anything of that nature. I just feel like it's not something I want to mess with. And I'm not even that much of a believer in the paranormal. It's just something about mirrors. It's very off to me. Um, I do have another question also sort of related to mirrors. What's your favorite horror movie? Or the best one that you've seen recently? I really want to read, or not read, I really want to watch a good horror movie. I haven't watched one in a while, and I would love to hear your suggestions. My personal favorite, off the top of my head, one is Mirrors. It's a really good film, and I was reminded of it because of this story. And then um, Grave Encounters. I recently saw that that was available on Prime Video. I might have to rewatch it because, oh man, it's, it was such a good movie when I first watched it. And I hope it holds up. Anyway, let me know. Have you ever had any strange feelings about mirrors? Have they ever given you an uneasy feeling? Do you think they are a portal? Or do you think they're just reflective paint and everyone's looking a little too deep into it? Let me know down in the comment section below. And as always, stay safe out there.